expect, uh, what would we expect if your candidate wins with regards the European integration, with regards implementation of European norms and rules? Uh, and so what Europe has to expect if your candidate wins? So please, I would like to start with the sequence which we have here, and then in the next round we will change the sequence of, of speakers. So please, please, uh, Rostislav uh, Pavlenko, representative of the team of Petro Poroshenko. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I want to thank you very much, first of all, the orga organizers of this event, because uh, it is very important to have uh, the a uh, discussion which is a discussion of uh, a substance and uh, hope uh, this will set an example for also discussions within Ukraine. Uh, speaking of the European and Euro-Atlantic integration and its role, uh, after the, the revolution of uh, dignity, uh, it was set actually as a goal for the country, and uh, this goal is being defended uh, on the front line uh, by uh, the forces and uh, helped by the, by the states and uh, the volunteers. And uh, uh, as an initiative of President Poroshenko, it is now set in the Constitution as an obligatory uh, thing that uh, should be abided by any politician that would uh, be a president, uh, prime minister, and uh, that would be in parliament uh, to uh, develop uh, the internal policies in order to uh, satisfy the European and Euro-Atlantic uh, integration criteria. Uh, the European and European uh, the and Euro Atlantic integration is actually the backbone and uh, the internal logic of uh, the uh, policies uh, to be led forth uh, by President Poroshenko, and uh, that is why we set uh, such an ambitious goal that in 2023 Ukraine is to be ready. Uh, for uh, applying to the European Union and uh, ready for uh, getting the membership action plan uh, with the NATO. Uh, we have a record uh, of uh, ambitious uh, uh, goals uh, and uh, a well-prepared and uh, cooperatively reached miracles. Uh, speaking of uh, the uh, visa-free regime, speaking of decentralization reform, speaking of uh, micro-financial stabilization and uh, uh, of course, uh, helping of uh, the Orthodox Church to get its independence. But big goals are set into very concrete and uh, very measurable steps, uh, and these we see within approach with the uh, association agreements uh, and uh, going further of uh, four unions, energy union, some was uh, discussed already, uh, the Schengen process in which there will be a majority of steps uh, of judicial reform, uh, uh, fighting corruption and uh, other things uh, that uh, influence justice, uh, the, uh, also the digital uh, union, uh, and uh, which actually goes for modernization of economy, and the customs union with the EU that set uh, goals for the internal economic uh, and uh, structural reforms, preparation for land reform, and uh, other things that are necessary for investment climate uh, and cooperation. And uh, uh, the MAP uh, will more elaborate probably in uh, uh, next parts, and uh, this is probably it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, first of all, I need just to, to remind uh, that we agreed that the intervention of this kind should be no longer than three minutes. Um, okay, so Grigory Nemiria, uh, Yulia Timoshenko's team. For those who are intrigued, Alexander has on his screen a signed president's seat. <laughs> Interesting debate. But I would like to join uh, my colleagues, uh, those who thanked uh, uh, the organizers for uh, a very timely event um, and uh, I don't think uh, but it's kind of symbolism that for the first edition of the Ukraine lab here in Brussels uh, the organizers has chosen a woman's face uh, uh, for the um, 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 poster uh, I hope that a, a positive symbolism in this but at the same time I have a rather uh, strange and quite a surreal feeling uh, debating Ukraine presidential elections so among the representatives of the presidential campaigns here in Brussels. Uh, 
perhaps it's more logical to have more debates of this kind, uh, especially on the leaders' level, back in Ukraine. And that's reminded me a very sad precedent set in uh, both 2010 and 2014, when uh, both Mr. Yanukovych and Mr. Poroshenko refused uh, to debate uh, in the presidential elections. I hope this time it would be different. And I would like to use this opportunity to uh, convey uh, via my friend Rostislav Pavlenko an informal invitation from uh, Yulia Timoshenko for his boss to debate uh, back in Ukraine, and if necessary, formal invitation uh, will uh, follow. As far as the question is concerned, uh, uh, the, what is Europe and where Ukraine fits to Europe? I try to be very precise to extent possible. And I have three points here. Point number one, Ukraine is Europe. Point number two, Europe is still work in progress. And point number three, Ukraine wants, and I firmly believe, has right to be a participant of this European unfinished project, which is still work in progress. That's encapsulate the organizing idea, the strategic message of Yulia Timoshenko for the future. I think it is a bit irresponsible to set dates. We've seen in the past many times that dates have been announced but then have not been met. But this is, I think, very important for the people as the message. Europe and Ukraine belongs to the same place in the world. And the second part, uh, my comment in this uh, regard, in this uh, um, part of the debate, about unfinished revolution. Really, it's quite a unique uh, case uh, when a country in the, in the course of uh, several years undergone through uh, two revolutions, Orange Revolution and Revolution of Dignity, or Euromaidan. And I think the consensus is that we're still facing an unfinished revolution agenda. So the promises were given, expectation were born, but they were not met. So as far as the unfinished business, unfinished revolutions, I believe Ukraine still needs a revolution, but revolution through an institutional change I would like to underline, Ukraine still needs a revolution, but revolution through an institutional change, not through the people on the street, especially in the context security-wise where Ukraine is now. Thank you. Grigori, uh, Irina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rostislav. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Alexandra, I'm so sorry. No At first, I want to say warm words of appreciation to the organizers of this event. Of course, we want to uh, show you our program and to say some words about team, of course. At first, uh, I was on two previous panels, and I want to say you that um, Vladimir Zelensky is absolutely pro-European candidate. Don't worry. Europe is a geopolitical partner, very, very important partner. Without uh, Europe, it is impossible uh, to come back to Donbass, to make some reconstruction in Donbass, and repayment of external debts accumulated of previous sources, of course. We heard today about change to constitution and about European uh, course of Ukraine. I want to remind you that the European integration and NATO is a secured in Ukrainian legislation since 2002. And from the, even that period, we are transit car, uh, country to go to European course. Of course, it is a long and systematic way. We all understand that while we have a military conflict in the eastern part of Ukraine, it is impossible to be a member of neither EU no NATO. But, uh, of course, we all do all our things to move faster. And what about the changes of constitution? 
Of course, uh, it's absolutely important and correct political course towards NATO and EU has been turned into political styles and slowly populist decisions. Just to put a tick next to that box of having a defect in the Constitution, it was written in preamble, not in the main body of the Constitution, Article 18, you know. When people wrote a preamble, before adoption some legislation. Uh, if you uh, read preamble of Constitution, uh, right, you understand about what I, what I mean. After five years from Euromaidan, we can find significant change in the civil society. It is devoted by moves and opportunities. People want not only no visa, people want European, American standards of life, European judiciary system, and level of combating corruption. That is why very important to direct, uh, to return to direct democracy. And here citizens on referendum, which is impossible in my country from 2012. The loan referendum was annulled and the one that succeeded was declared as unconstitutional in 2017. During 20 years statehood is one only two national referendums. Uh, the second one was not ratified. But it's very important, during 11 years from uh, 1991 till uh, 2012, we have had 153 local referendums. We need to revive this as soon as possible. In priority issues will stay contractions of Russian aggression, European and Euro-Atlantic integration, promotion of a positive image of Ukraine, stimulating foreign direct investment, economic development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irina. Oleg. <coughs> Thank you. So I definitely can't but uh, congratulate the organizers of this event on daring attempt to practically and pragmatically support European integration through the merging between uh, the intellectual circles of Kiev and Brussels. Because we, we uh, the big problem, I guess, uh, that this event tries to, uh, in this or this way, to mitigate is that we there, there are mostly myths about Europe in Ukraine, there are mostly myths about Ukraine in Europe, and without this open kind of debate between the, uh, the intellectual circles, the educated part of the society, the social active part of the societies, uh, would never really come to the real point of uh, integration, because uh, I can hardly imagine any serious Ukrainian politicians debating issues that are really serious for Europe, like migration, traditional values against liberalism, globalization, etc. Well, few of Europeans, I believe, really debate the issues that are relevant for Ukrainians. And from this standpoint, from the in, in our intellectual information sphere, we still remain much far more part of the post-Soviet space, debating issues like Eurovision, etc., that are not relevant for what is important for people in the European Union. Uh, so now about what Europe is. So uh, Mr. Donald Tusk in his famous speech just recently in Verkhovna Rada said that you Europeans should learn from Ukrainians what Europe is, right? Uh, but let's dare, in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, what, uh, as, as how maybe I only understand Europe, but for me Europe first and foremost is peace, tolerance, um, tolerance towards other opinions, tolerance towards minorities, tolerance towards those who don't share your views. Well, and truly a reconciliation and dialogue as two principal instruments uh, that are used to mitigate any crisis. While what we see in Ukraine, we see militant propaganda, we see radical nationalism, we see appraisal of xenophobia, we see lack of tolerance, not only to politicians, but even to part of the society that don't share the uniform, nationalistic vision of Ukraine that the ruling uh, coalition tries to implement in our country. So I doubt that at this point, unfortunately, it's up to Europeans to learn from us what Europe is. Unfortunately, it's st still a long, long work to be done in our own country to understand that radicalism, nationalism, are almost swear words in this part of the, of the world. Um, also, uh, about uh, the role of Europe uh, in um, Yuri Boyka's campaign, also definitely I would like to stress this first and foremost, I say for myself, I'm like not his press secretary at all, I just help him with the campaign and consult him. Uh, but definitely, uh, we always refer to Europe as a standard bearer. No one, if he is not a crazy person, 
even if he supports reconciliation with Russia, would ever use Russia as a standard bearer. Because when we have problems with human rights, when we have problems with democracy, when we have problems with pressure and opposition, we always refer to Europe as uh, structures that set the standards. And uh, here we have a very bad, bad trend. While through the rhetoric of our government, Europe turns in the heads of many of Ukrainians into a kind of geopolitical bloc, just, just, just geopolitically, for its selfish interests, opposes Russia, as Russia does geopolitically for its selfish interests, opposes the West. While it's not the case, as far as I understand, the majority of Europeans don't want to be in any conflict or in any partnership, in, in any alliance with Russia, and just want to be normal neighbors that trade, that share certain values, and that, that see all of the eastern part of our continent is becoming closer and closer um, uh, to the general understanding what Europe should be in the future. Um, and the basic thing is Ukraine, with all the problems we always had, used to be always a bridge between east and west. While our government wants to find a new mission for our nation, they want it to be a wall between East and West. And they want and they believe that in the shadow of this wall, they will easily hide their corruption, incompetence, and abuse of power. They want, moreover, Europeans, you, to pay for this wall because they take loans under the pretext of fighting Russia. All these loans are effectively meant to, to help Ukraine reform its economy, make it richer, and after all, help to reconcile with our, our own citizens living to the east of the front line. So, that is the basic thing uh, that is very important for us uh, in our campaign. To stress to Ukrainians that still Europe is not, uh, so, so that still Europe is not just an opponent to Russia. It's just a set of different values and standards. It's not a geopolitical power that is opposing Russia as a, as a nation. It's a, it's, a, it's a power that opposes Russia with regard to values, etc., etc., etc. So. That is very important for us, and that's why uh, we always refer to Europe, but we want Europe to be more serious about understanding that those who wave the EU flag, but still got into endemic corruption that we have, that still makes the country the poorest in Europe, as, we, as it is a fact now, okay. they discredit not themselves, Reklamen. they discredit the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Svetlana, the floor is yours. Please keep close to three minutes limit. Dear colleagues and dear friends, thank you so much for coming here today for your interest in Ukraine. I believe that the future of Ukraine will be a strong factor for the security uh, here in Europe, in European Union. And uh, I also would like to underline that the future leader of our country president together with the parliament has to do everything possible to approximate our EU membership, NATO membership. And I believe we'll, we'll sit here as the country in a different capacity. However, we have to acknowledge as well, very honestly acknowledge that first of all, it's very hard homework. It's not a level of the declaration. It's not amendments to the constitutions. It's hundreds, dozens of uh, very good policies. It's hundreds of reforms in army, in security, rule of law, anti-corruption. This is what will make Ukraine really Euro-Atlantic and really European. Uh, I'd like to talk, to touch upon both European and Euro-Atlantic integration, since we are sitting also in the capital of both. Uh, it is absolutely undeniable choice of Ukrainian people after Euromaidan. But also, let's be honest, it's the only way to answer our fundamental challenges. What are they? There are two of them, I believe. First, it's security. And when it comes to security, we have to do everything possible to make a very fundamental internal transformation, to make army stronger, to make our NATO compatible policies. But also, we have to be a contributor to various problems in front of EU, Euro Atlantic uh, uh, community even today. And for example, I'm talking about um, the fact that NATO can't solve the issue of an INF, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, without including Ukraine in this context. Um, I'm also talking about that EU and NATO can't solve the issue of energy security without Ukraine. And here we come to Nord Stream 2 and so on and so forth. 
Secondly, when we, come, when we are talking about Euro-Atlantic and European integration, it's of course rule of law and economic transformation. And I believe these two areas are very much interconnected. Without real breakthrough, with independent judicial system, with an independent anti-corruption infrastructure, it is impossible to make our country stronger, people's prosperous, and to be a strong partner because it is very important for our country not to be helped, but Ukraine must be considered means з Україною повинні рахуватися in Ukrainian. And uh, I'll stop uh, here with one more comment. The formula for European and Euro-Atlantic integration in Ukraine for the future should be less declarations and more actions. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. So uh, now we have uh, to proceed to the second uh, round of intervention in which each of you has a chance to deliver major, maybe few points of your proposal to Ukraine. Here, just uh, to let people understand what is the main elements which distinguish your team from the others. What do you propose? And then uh, you have, again, just three minutes. I understand that's not an easy issue uh, to deliver, but we made our choice. <laughs> Svetlana, starting with you. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, I feel that fake reforms intoxicating Ukrainian society, but also intoxicating our European real partners uh, in their uh, readiness or um, willingness uh, to support, to support uh, Ukraine. And Ukraine doesn't have to give any um, arguments for the justification uh, for our partners uh, to use this uh, to use this card. So we have to make very crystal clear that the internal refor reforms are the real factor for the breakthrough on all of the levels. So um, Mr. Hrysenko's uh, priorities for internal reforms is, uh, of course, rule of law, which I said already, and it's a part of European integration. Independent courts with no telephone rights for the president. Independent general prosecutor. He's the only candidate who will declare, who will uh, introduce his uh, candidate for, the gen for this position before the election, so that people will choose not, as we say, the cat, uh, the, the, someone like a dark horse, but will know who this is. Uh, whether it's brother, whether it's relative, whether he is uh, actually reliable, whether he is capable to fight corruption independently. Also, uh, of course, we have to make stronger na na uh, National Anti-Corruption uh, Bureau of Ukraine to give them an autonomous uh, so-called uh, tap wire uh, to be more efficient to investigate uh, high-ranking politicians. Also, we have to reset national uh, um, anti-corruption... Uh, just a second. NAPC, NAZIKA? National Agency on Preventing of Corruption. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, because they are actually... Um, they are biased and they are not doing their job properly. We have to also fire the anti-corruption prosecutor uh, and the, we've seen that those leaks from his cabinet are giving the preconditions to, to, to consider uh, that he is working by the order of the administration of the president. Uh, we have to also make the reform of the custom custom and tax authority. These are billions to Ukrainian budgets and maybe we'll have to ask less from the World Bank and IMF while we'll introduce those tough reforms in Ukraine uh, itself. Also, when it comes to liberal reforms, of course, privatization and land market, this is what we need to reform our old enterprises and to endorse our economy with the free land market, of course, after very strong um, and transparent register of the lands uh, in Ukraine. And finally, elections. We have to make it a sacred cow. And I'm, to be honest, ashamed 
what is happening five years after Euromaidan in Ukraine, when we observe the massive voter bribings in Ukraine, use of administrative resources in Ukraine. I think this is unacceptable and it has to be prosecuted. Uh, Minister for Interior just recently said that there were already 70 cases of those voter bribings and I believe that the power that allows to um, uh, buy, buy elections, those have to go into the past. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Svetlana. And now, Oleg Voloshin, uh, your message. Uh. Uh, thank you. So we go in this sequence, okay. Uh, so, um, you know, it's not even about the, the, the meaning of this event for me is that, unfortunately, um, uh, in Brussels and in Strasbourg, where, like, uh, the basic institutions of the European Union are, uh, our European colleagues to rally here, not only the opinion of particular politician, it's not only about Yuri Boyka personally, it's about the large part of the society, and it's like, if you want, the whole political camp uh, that represents certain sets of ideas that is also full of competition inside, but that shares almost, uh, in general, basic, uh, same, basically same uh, vision uh, how the country should develop. Uh, so, um, we re I represent those who don't come to Europe for money or weapons. We always come to Europe for dialogue and for the support of values that Europe publicly endorses. So we don't knock the closed door of Europe, uh, the, for, for the moment, closed door of, Europe, of, me of EU membership. Because maybe unlike our opponents, we are too polite to rush somewhere we are not really welcome. Uh, but we are definitely interested in developing economic cooperation and uh, security cooperation and other forms of cooperation, and, and first and foremost, uh, in introducing real European values inside Ukraine. And that's, that makes us very different because we are all have a political campus, not only about Yuri Boyka personally, uh, stand for solution of Donbass crisis through, through compromise and reconciliation. What is interesting, I guess you all mentioned, that our politicians representing the government, they always com come into Washington, New York, uh, Brussels, Berlin, doesn't matter, whatever Western capital or big political center, they always shy enough to reject Minsk agreements. They always say that they heart and bone devoted and, uh, to implementation of the Minsk agreements, while they are too shy to do it inside the country. They even were shy enough to introduce, uh, to, 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 uh, to recall the Minsk agreements in the loans on the, on the so-called reintegration of Donbass. So it shows that they try to sell to Ukrainian audience inside the populist and militant stance, while they do pretty well understand that no one in, in the West, especially in European Union, would ever agree to help to solve the Donbass crisis with any other methods but diplomatic. Uh, we unequivocally support the Minsk agreements, we understand how complex and difficult it is to implement them. We understand how many ch additional changes need to be introduced, maybe even to the, to the very text of the agreements, or at least uh, how many additional new agreements should be signed to have them implemented, and how many concessions should be done on the part of Russia, definitely, uh, as a country that annexed Crimea that supports a separatist conflict in the East, and that is without any, beyond any debate. Uh, but unlike others, we don't offer Europe five other years of smoldering conflict. We say, help us to help you to stop war in the east of Europe. We don't ask for, us for new sanctions. We don't ask for additional credits. We just ask you for not supporting those who stand for war in Ukraine and who use this war to conceal corruption and their ineffectiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Oleg. Uh, Irina? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alexander. Dear colleagues, I want to stress that program clearly states that Mr. Zelensky is running for one term. The aim is to change system for future sakes. What kind of Ukrainian state do we have now? I think that it's feudal princedom of neo-patrimonial democracy uh, with a few financial or in and industrial groups or simply oligarchs fighting each other within the formal electoral framework to hold on and size power and resource. The incumbent president has his hands on the security and financial sector, the total dependent judicial system, and virtually pocket parliament. 
This cartel is founded on the distribution of corruption opportunities to the players and the balance of power between them. The latest research by, uh, conducted by the Razumkov Center, uh, it was published by Ukrainska Pravda last week, shows us the level of trust to, to the president, it is only 5%, to the parliament, it is only 1%, and it is the locus indicator, to the governments, 1.5, and to the Supreme Court, 2%, between 30 positions. This were our messages, of course, first is stopping corruption. I will speak about it in the fourth block, about uh, uh, Ukraine in five years. And now I want to stop on the strong regions. Of course, we want strong regions. We want decentralization, reasonable proportional distribution of the central government agency in other big cities besides the capital. It is crucial for Ukraine to launch the development in other cities. Everything is censored in Kyiv, and the capital is, also, is already smothered with the influx of people and concentration of financial resources. This imbalance is a natural trigger for mistakes within staff appointments, the monopolization of power, abuses, and corruption. We have to make border regions economically attractive, exactly border regions in Ukraine, of course, e-governance. State should be just the moderator. Uh, state uh, should just give us public services, uh, give us safety and development. We plan to minimize the role of state in a person's life. Poverty, next message. The Ukraine is the poorest country in the Europe. We will introduce a one-time zero declaration for business. The state's priority should be lie with stimulating foreign direct investments where investors have long-term commitments to support investment projects. We need to protect even the smallest investor. The best way for Ukraine to secure oneself against any foreign aggression is to be the money hub all over the world. Ensure establishment of a transparent land market. Yes, we are again moratorium. Transparency privatization with the involvement of foreign investors through initial public offers at the public capital market. IPO is to become a transparent mechanism to privatize big state mechanism and banks. Innovative economy will be in priority. Taxation will be simple and easily understood. Even me, I can't read tax code till the end before it change really. Replacing a corporate profit tax with a capital exit tax give business more space for growth and bring down and administrative pressure. Everyone should pay taxes and do that personally, not by tax agent. This is the beginning of the responsible citizen. And we want to introduce of economic passport of Ukrainians. Every newborn will have a trust fund accumulating a proportional share of proceeds that the state receives from the sale of natural resources. When they come of age, the money will be made available for the person forming the initial capital. It will forge an economic link between state and the citizen. Thank you very much. And floor goes to Grigory. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Just a small uh, preface. Uh, well, when I recently met uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Slovakia, Lajcek, uh, who visited uh, most recently uh, the contact line, he said something that I, I really didn't expect him to say. He said, I look at the eyes of people who are crossing, staying in line, crossing this uh, contact line, and there were no hopes empty eyes. They're not so much afraid. There were no fear, no hope, just eyes that says nothing. So this is, in a way, an impression of the, the person, the diplomat, I respect very much, that encapsulate the real challenge that uh, whoever aspires to lead Ukraine has to deal with. Disillusionment, frustration, growing cynicism, and then the question to be asked, 
whether Ukraine would survive, would Ukraine survive if it will be in the status quo or will continue to be led by inertia, which is increasingly more and more counterproductive? Timoshenko's answer, no. Status quo kills Ukraine. Inertia is counterproductive. Status quo coupled with counterproductive inertia is a threat to Ukraine as a viable state. There are two schools of thoughts that suggest into dealing with those facts on the ground. The one school of thoughts that most of the candidates uh, for the presidency seems to belong to, they say that we will continue reform but we'll do them better than the incumbent. We will do more of this, more of that, uh, we will be better. And uh, the alternative school of thought to which uh, Timoshenko belongs to said we have to find an escape from the vicious circle when every next electoral cycle brings more of the same, sometimes even with new faces, but more of the same. That explains why Ukraine is lagging behind of so many countries, including our neighbors, in so many dimensions. So her proposal is we have to have enough political courage and responsibility as a leadership uh, to change fundamentals. And the example that uh, very topical now. Svetlana mentioned uh, the anti-corruption efforts. Five new institutions have been established with a beautiful organizing idea. You cannot fight corruption in a country where it's systemic, so you have to invent those institutions from the scratch, stuff them with people who are aspire trust, accountable, and then you will achieve the critical mass. And it's a unanimous opinion that unfortunately, three or four years after those efforts, yet the anti-constitutional court yet to be fully functional, but so far there is a growing feeling of frustration. The goal has not been reached. Ukraine still 120 country out of 180 of the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, which makes it second most corrupt country in Europe after Russia. So. Shall we continue to do more to fire prosecutors, special uh, uh, anti-corruption prosecutor, to re-establish anti-corruption bureau, and then hopefully we will get, basically, shall we roll the dice in the game of fortune again? Or we have to try to change fundamentals to establish institutional mechanism that would prevent these enablers of corruption to reappear again and again. So this is a very important difference. And the second important difference that differentiates Timoshenko is a very well-prepared and thought through new economic course. And we already had an opportunity to discuss it in uh, Munich with the uh, director manager, managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, which we believe is uh, a guarantee of the healthy continuity new social policy, and of course a very important uh, condition sine qua non is achievement of the peace on the Ukrainian national interest, not on the concessions that inconsistent with Ukraine national interest. So take in this, you have a fundamental change, a proposal as far as the reinvention of the country's Europe a uh, large, deep constitutional reform, and you have sectoral economic policies. This, by the way, very much in line with what I read recently, Michael Emerson, recent paper on the scenarios of the wider Europe where I think Ukraine fits uh, perfectly. Thank you. Okay. So now we have Rostislav. Please, maybe you may have 30 seconds more as, uh, to equal <laughs> your chances. 
to deliver. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, dear colleagues, the days are set uh, for internal usage and to be internally ready. And uh, uh, this means uh, fulfilling the already set plans. The association agreement gives such a plan and also fulfill the constitution, which is amended not only in preamble, but also in the meaningful parts, setting obligations uh, for the uh, president, uh, the parliament and uh, the uh, government. But actually, uh, the uh, main goal is uh, to overcome poverty because poverty is uh, exactly uh, the basis uh, for many manipulations. Uh, it's, uh, it gives rise uh, to uh, populism and it enables uh, so many uh, uh, appear, uh, uh, addresses uh, to um, uh, fake uh, images uh, that uh, sometimes uh, lure some uh, people into uh, discussing and uh, giving uh, chances for some of the politicians. Uh, what is necessary to overcome poverty? This is necessary to uh, fulfill things uh, that uh, have their basis uh, already set. We know that uh, the majority of the reforms uh, do take time and we see that, uh, for instance, uh, highly praised uh, judicial reform in Romania uh, took about 10 years to be fully fledged and meaningful. Uh, decentralization reform in Poland took uh, seven or eight years before uh, really it was uh, completed. We do not have uh, so much time. Uh, we do what we can and uh, wh whenever we can, uh, we are using resources uh, to uh, support people and uh, uh, draw for uh, necessary uh, reform um, efforts uh, into meaningful changes within the country. One of the meaningful changes is actually, uh, so to say, to dry the swamps of uh, corruption, because fighting corruption is not only uh, apprehending the corrupt people, which is absolutely necessary, but also systemic changes. Uh, here al already uh, the experts uh, cited uh, the uh, results uh, of anti-corruption uh, reforms uh, that uh, saved uh, billions of dollars, I think about uh, six billion dollars a year uh, uh, from uh, uh, cutting and destroying the corrupt schemes uh, and allowing the money to uh, come to the budget. Uh, also, uh, the anti-corruption institutions uh, should uh, uh, gain maturity to really go after those uh, who are their targets, and I think we'll uh, see that uh, happening increasingly. Uh, next, decentralization. Uh, people get uh, resources, uh, localities, uh, local communities uh, are empowered with this, uh, yet uh, it is now necessary uh, to really be um, developed uh, in uh, terms uh, of uh, the manpower potential, in terms of competences, in terms uh, of educating people how to use uh, those rights, and uh, all these things uh, are uh, at hand uh, and uh, uh, coming. Uh, then, uh, speaking of uh, justice at large and uh, the elections, uh, uh, the previous panel, I think, took uh, some uh, uh, attention about the observations about the civil society and uh, the uh, necessary of proof uh, so that uh, each and every instance uh, of any fraud uh, uh, should uh, be uh, um, met uh, and uh, persecuted, whereas uh, hollow declarations should remain hollow declarations. And last, uh, and uh, I stopped here as we are approaching also parliamentary elections and the necessity to have a responsible coalition, then the economic reforms uh, uh, will uh, be deepened in uh, the uh, way of uh, less administration, a more uh, prudent taxation and support uh, uh, of the uh, basics that will now allow for more development. Okay, thank you, Rostislav. And uh, uh, we have, have been informed that we have to stop at uh, this panel at 6 10 so therefore we have a shortage of time and i've promised and um, th there my suggestion is to have just one intervention more for each and then we will have 15 minutes debate so just one intervention which is about the vision of the future what ukraine can be after the next five years if your plan is winning if you your team has a chance to to implement what what you promise so what realistically we can expect in this period of time uh, we as a citizens and also citizens of ukraine but also europe what can ex expect from ukraine in this case please rostislav 
and this in the first sequence. Uh, thank you. Uh, the uh, Ukraine uh, would be a contributor and a responsible cooperator in the issues uh, of uh, European security, uh, issues of uh, human development uh, in Europe, and an integrated part uh, of uh, the pan-European projects in energy, in uh, transportation, uh, and uh, in uh, having the uh, joint investment projects uh, both in Ukraine and uh, in the region based upon uh, what I finished uh, in my uh, previous uh, uh, intervention uh, exactly in using the basics already created uh, developing the uh, agro sector uh, not uh, only growing crops but also uh, uh, Okay, uh, the, uh, processing them, uh, the industrial uh, development uh, through usage of digitalization and cooperation in this regard, uh, the transportation and local development, uh, and uh, the development uh, of uh, uh, different cultural and educational ties uh, to help uh, create a bigger Europe in which Ukraine is an integrated part. About 10 years ago, it was fashionable in this uh, uh, city to quote Chernomedin, who said it's always uh, difficult to predict, especially the future. So uh, what would happen in five years, one could judge in terms of the, uh, the expectations and the ability to deliver. I think what is lacking deliverable. Churchill said, politics rewards those who persevere. I think this a quality of leadership which is uh, lacking now. Fear is high, trust is low. But the vision of Ukraine in five years definitely and naturally brings a hope for Ukraine more secure, more democratic, more prosperous, and more modern in all senses. For that uh, to happen, it is important to understand that Ukraine is part of this work in progress, which is Europe. This year, on the 31st of May, we will have marked the 30th anniversary of uh, George W. Uh, H. W. Bush speech at the German city of Mainz, where he was speaking about Europe uh, whole and free and at peace. So this is the message and this the challenge to make it happen. Without Ukraine whole, restoring its territorial integrity, there will be no Europe which is whole. Without free Ukraine, they're not going to be free Europe. And without peaceful Ukraine, they're not going to be Europe at peace. So that message has two sides. It's a message to Ukrainians, but also this is a message to politicians here in this city and other European capitals, that our future depends on all of us. The responsibility of the Ukrainian leadership is to keep their words, not to promise something that cannot be delivered, as we've seen with the previous uh, promises of the incumbent, who then needs to be changed for the totally different slogans. And last but uh, not least, we have to understand that window of opportunity, which is natural with every new president, with regained or receiving new political capital, this time, in Ukraine is going to be extremely narrow. That speaks for the preparedness now, for engagement now, not waiting until the results of the second round. And it also gives a signal that people would not tolerate anymore in the way they tolerate it so far. Empty promises, more corruption instead of less corruption, and all the other things. And I read today, and on a very personal and friendly note, and I really believe it's a good dream of President Poroshenko that consider his next stage of his political career to become in five years a member of the European Parliament. If that would be the case, probably, that would be the richest member of the European Parliament from the poorest country. And I think it, it, it would be uh, premature uh, to consider uh, such uh, uh, case as a, as a positive for Ukraine. But I wish... Uh, 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 President Poroshenko to fulfill this uh, goal and uh, for that probably we all need to put our joint efforts. Thank you. 
dear friends, our kids, our parents live in Ukraine. That's why we will do the best, even what we can, and even what we can't, to live in safety country, in peace, in our big country. And all 9 million people who now are out of Ukraine, they come back. We stop this missiles epidemiologic situation in country, you know. Uh, I think that the, uh, in five years it will be the rule of law instead of the rule by law. Our first drafts in this sphere will work as a law. The law on lifting the immunity of president of Ukraine, members of parliament and judges, on the impeachment of president of Ukraine, <laughs> on the recall of members of parliament. Imminence of liability, just and legal punishment. The parliament will be fair. Parliamentary and local elections will be based on the open list system. Button passion and the absence from work by MPs will be inevitably result in stripping of such MPs of their mandates. The judiciary will turn a power not only in name only, not a servant to the president, the government, the parliament or local authorities. We will bring back the trust in and respect for the court of law. It's one of the pillars hold, holding of any state. The judge shall be fair, serving the high mission and the rule of law. We will combat corruption. Now we have clans of politicians who have been in power for 20, 24 years out of the 20 years of Ukrainian statehood. They are connected through old ties, nepotism, business projects, old grievances. They are not able to get out of matrix because they are part of it. That's why Ukraine uh, not only needs new faces, Ukraine needs new ideas. And this is the second important principle of bringing to power people from outside of establishment who are professionals and upright citizens. Together we can change not only the nature of the state politics and the way of its implementing, we can also change a mindset of Ukraine. Because there are two sides to corruption, who's who gives and who take. A reasonable and active civil society is the one at the beginning of each step as an accountability marker with the political, legal, ethical components coupled with the inevitable proportional and legitimate punishment. Zero tolerance to corruption. Those accused of corruption should not be entitled to be released on bail and the conviction should lead to the confiscation of property and a life ban on holding public office. Anti-corruption institutions have to be effectively on yield results, unlike now when they show no results whatsoever. I lack figures. If we look at last year, this institution managed to reclaim only 5,000 USAD for the state budget, therefore making all those huge resources spent on the establishment and operations bring no return at the end of the day. Please, $5,000 for whole years. We will have an absolutely transparency for the authorities' operations, automations for public processes, favorable business conditions for entrepreneurs, so that they are not driven into politics, deregulations and one-line procedures for receiving main public permits. We need state operations to run as simply and so user-friendly as a smartphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, I don't believe that someone here or elsewhere does believe that in five years Ukraine can become as rich as Belgium or as uh, corruption-free society as Norway is today. But what can really be different in five years is that can Ukraine can again become a peaceful nation without war on its territory. And um, I'm very, I wouldn't say very, but I'm quite optimistic about this uh, also because of what I heard today. I fully, I, I happily nod in, uh, in, in agreement with what Mr. Nimira said, or what Svetlana said, and others. I read a lot of uh, suggestions, quite reasonable, on the part of Mr. Gritsenka and even on the part of Mr. Poroshenko, whom I know for years so, and who I believe in his heart really wants Ukraine to become peaceful again. Um, Yuri Boyka does have a viable, and his team do, do have a viable plan of uh, restoring peace on Donbass, but we are quite aware and conscious 
of the fact that our part of the society, our part of political spectrum cannot re re make any change, make any difference in a country without building strong partnership and open dialogue with the politicians representing the other side of the society. And uh, Ukraine has always been rich through its differences. We should again start celebrating diversity as Europe does. We should again start celebrating different views and, ma and making Ukraine a kind of what European Union tries to be. A melting pot where different ideas that might be rejected from the first step by someone at the end of the day, after a long discussion, become a general cause and a general, um, a general uh, value. So uh, I believe that in five years, Ukraine would finally cease to be a burden for our European friends, and it finally become an asset, a country that objectively would still be definitely outside of European Union, uh, but that can be a very important and necessary source both of economic uh, development, of new opportunities, and even uh, from the standpoint of values. I believe that this kind of discussion, it's, it's, a, it's good that we Ukrainians discuss our problems with Europeans, but I would like, I would welcome our European friends to invite more of Ukrainians to discuss their own issues, because on issues of migration, LGBT, values, etc., etc., Ukrainians have also a lot to say. We are not just neighbors. I believe that sooner or later we will still be together. So it means that uh, in five years, if there's no peace, we have these all options open. If there is no peace, there is no need to discuss whatever else. Thank you. Thank you, Oleg, quite clear. And uh, Svetlana, final remark. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, we with the Ukrainian delegation went to the Museum of European History. It's a new museum not far away from here. And we very vividly felt that sometimes European integration taken for granted. But in fact, it shouldn't be. Because probably it's the greatest achievement of humanity, but this achievement came through a very tough fight of generations. And I feel also that this is um, this uh, inflection point of Ukraine, that we also have to understand that we are making our history. And when I'm talking about future in five years, I'm not just talking about dreams, but I, I would like to say that this is absolutely possible with a real political will, with a real political leadership to stand behind these reforms, not to, just to declare them, not just to say them, not just to show them in front of beautiful European audience, but really will it and do it. Ritsenko told that he will come for one term. I believe that it will give him the preconditions to not to fight further, not to be in this electoral side, uh, cycle of fighting for the electoral scores, but uh, it gives him more readiness and willingness to uh, do a very painful reforms. And I see my country, first of all, with deoccupied Donbass and with a very strong coalition to fight for deoccupied and reintegrated Crimea. Secondly, I see Ukraine with the fastest growing economy in Europe, five, seven, and finally 10%. With uh, people coming back from Poland and many other countries as uh, labor migrants with more foreign investments in Ukraine, because if they come, nine million of people don't have to go for the seasonal works in other uh, European countries. I also see my country without impunity. I would like to see MPs, deputy ministers, head of the tax authority being in jail. This is what will give the real sign for the world and for Ukrainians that Ukraine is uh, European. I hope not all MPs made in jail. <laughs> Some of them who violated the law, True. as well as we see it in many other really democratic and European countries. And uh, the last point, I also want to see that Ukraine in five year years will choose the candidates, their leaders, amongst people uh, of a completely different uh, generation. I think that Ukrainians deserve the right to choose amongst people who are not already for 15 and 20 years in politics. I believe with the new generation, we can expect also a new real shift of <coughs> values and, uh, and uh, real readiness to make this country European. Thank you.
Thank you. So we have a chance to ask questions and I see already at least 10, 10 of them. So I, I hope, I think that it will be enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sergei has, and I see, just, I cannot uh, uh, mark each of you because you are 10. Just let me do the following way. Sergei Sidorenko, Irina Bekeshkina, then uh, uh, you in the next row, and who was in that part, in the, uh, Michael Emerson. So there will be first three, and then we will go back. So please, Sergei. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I, I have a simple question to all of participants, uh, because any of participants, of only uh, Rostislav, have made a clear statements about NATO and EU integration. I have heard plenty of um, beautiful words, but no con concrete uh, promises. So please, could you elaborate whether you support Ukraine to move towards uh, membership in the EU uh, to uh, implement unconditionally association agreement and regarding NATO uh, annual national plan, do you support unconditional implementation of it and do you support membership in the NATO? I would concretely stress, please avoid uh, words like uh, United Europe or joint, uh, I don't know, security systems, NATO and the EU. Thank you. Thank you. I ask uh, panelists to fix this question and we will uh, give, a ch give a chance to others and then come back to you. So, Irina. <coughs> Microphone, microphone. Uh, because Irina Venediktova uh, said uh, uh, that uh, according to a uh, survey of uh, Rosenkov Center, uh, president uh, had uh, a trust in 5%, a government in 1%, and parliament in 1%. It is not correct, because usually in all uh, surveys uh, there are some uh, um, uh, answers uh, totally disagree, rather disagree, totally agree, rather agree in every, and yes, and uh, usually, usually not only in Ukraine, it is needed to summarize, uh, rather agree and totally agree. And in this case, yes, uh, totally agree to President 5% and rather degree uh, 18%. And uh, I think you uh, will be sure that uh, 23% is much more than oh, 5%. No. Yes. No. Yes, but. Okay. Uh, maybe, yes, yes, but count, count correctly, count correctly. And uh, so uh, I, I, uh, I'd like uh, you to use figures correctly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irina, for your comment. Michael. <coughs> Thank you very much. I would have loved to have had a full session on Donbass, uh, unfortunately not time, but I therefore have just one very precise Donbass question, and it concerns the current uh, blockade, trade blockade by Kiev of the Eastern Donbass. Uh, does your candidate, and I put it provocatively now, does your candidate understand that this blockade is likely to be counterproductive with a view to the reintegration of the Eastern Donbass into the rest of Ukraine. <clears throat> One more question before we uh, go, uh, Igor. No. Uh, thank you very much. I would like actually well to ask well, one very simple question. Well, all your intentions, I'm talking about all the speakers, and plans when it comes to economy goes far beyond the mandate of the Ukrainian president. So I have a question. If you win the elections, are you going to change the constitution to make your president the prime minister of the country? Thank you. Thank you. So we That, yeah. So, uh, so that makes a challenge because uh, we have quite few questions, but to each of them, to each of you. So please be as short as possible answering. Please, uh, let's let's go this way from uh, right flank to the left. Yeah. Uh, Not fair. Okay. Oleg. Uh, so. Uh, 
you fixed. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, um, as for nature, I guess for Sergey and for others, it's quite clear. So we don't see, uh, not just for practical reasons, uh, we don't see any reasonable opportunity to reconcile with our neighbor, provided that re Ukraine uh, really, not just in rhetoric, what happens now, uh, but really uh, moves towards the membership in the alliance. So we just don't uh, see any, uh, we may like or to dislike, but that's the uh, never changing for, for decades already position of, of Russia, that uh, they believe uh, for them it's easier, although I definitely disagree with this, but I'm not a Russian citizen, uh, or not a Russian politician, but they believe that it is same for them, it is more reasonable to start a preliminary war with Ukraine rather than see Ukraine calmly and quietly become a member of NATO with all particular consequences. With regard to European Union, uh, I, I like the, uh, the wonderful joke, or maybe it's a joke, or, we, uh, or an idea of Mr. Nemiria with regard to Ms. Poroshenko becoming a member of European Parliament. I, I would also love to, 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 to become a member of European Parliament. Who of us wouldn't? Uh, but uh, let's be realistic. Let's talk about uh, something uh, that is really on the agenda. And that's why declaring EU membership, and you as a journalist who works many years on this dimension, knows that the, the renowned Ukraine fatigue started not with corruption in our country, not with a uh, long war, etc. It started with everlasting knocking in the closed door. While all the time Europeans said, guys, please do whatever, but stop talking about membership. No, please promise us membership, give us membership in the association agreement, etc. And it created the fatigue. And as a diplomat, I understand how stupid it is to decide for a European Union whether they want any nation or they don't want any nation. Let's become a nation that European Union definitely wants in. Um, as for the blockade of Donbass, it's, it's clear that Ukraine shot in its own leg, and they were, <laughs> President Poroshenko initially said the same. Prime Minister Groisman initially said the same. But finally, because of, I don't know who advised them on that, they decided that it's better to play this game who's a great patriot, and they finally legitimized this blockade. That effectively caused only two things. The increased, dramatic increase of uh, um, um, uh, smuggling of uh, coal, and uh, you know who is the la largest and one of the largest suppliers of coal to Ukraine, Belarus, that doesn't have any mine now. It's just ridiculous. It just proves that Ukraine cannot live without this coal. We just pretend we don't buy it. Uh, and that's, by the way, the big difference between us and uh, those in the government. They, on many things, understand that effectively many of the, oh, their suggestions with regard to fighting Russia are unrealistic, but they believe that Ukrainian pop, pop petrols are stupid enough not to understand that their rhetoric has nothing to do with reality. So that's why definitely, Reconciliation means lifting of the of, of uh, blockade. Uh, Russia sh definitely should cancel their ill-sought decision of recognition of certain documents issued by the separatists. And like, would you please by, stop by the way, the way Rostislav can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but in this in presidential administration there was a discussion about the. Uh, please stop the anti-Ukrainian show here, please. Sorry? Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, so you are not a moderator. Look, this is. I this see a high level of tolerance is like I'm a citizen of Ukraine. No, 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 no. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's a peculiar issue for Europeans, but not for Soviets. Oh, oh, all right. Okay. Be brief. Uh, Irene. Michael? Yeah. Uh, dear colleagues, first, NATO and EU. NATO, yes. EU, yes. NATO, we need professional army. We need standards of professional army and standards of NATO, of course. And we need principles of uh, making this professional army. NATO uh, make your army without corruption. EU, of course, yes, we speak about it and we are pro-European candidate. About figures, uh, be sure, I am very, very polite with figures because I work with figures. You see five columns, including uh, difficult to answer. I spoke only about the column I don't totally trust. That's why you can check these uh, figures uh, by yourself. The thought, reintegration, uh, do we understand the risks of uh, reintegration and difficulties? Of course, I not live in the very high spheres of atmosphere. I live in Kharkiv, mm -hmm. it's a body region, okay. and I work with students from Donbass. They each time go to our session from borders, 
they gave huge bribes on the borders, they won their babies on Donbass, and they, they should go to Ukrainian territory with this one-month baby to register it. I know about pensioners who stayed in line during a lot of, a lot of hours to take their pensions. I am on the field. I know about what I speak, and we know the problems of these people, and we know the problems of that generation. The war is last five years, more than Second World War. Uh, people, uh, kids who were five years, now 10 years old, who were 15 years, now 20 years old. It's a new generation. It's a huge cultural problem, and we understand it. The fourth question, are we going to change constitution? Now, I can say subject and opinion, my opinion. I like our constitution. It's a perfect really. We have a problem to um, do it with it. Uh, we have problem with law enforcement. But uh, I said that Vladimir Zelensky uh, tried to um, return democracy in our country uh, and direct democracy too. He tried to hear people, he tried to hear their visions, and if people decide to go to referendum and to change con to constitution, we come back to this question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, it'll be very short. Sergei, yes and yes. Pani Reina, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Emerson, uh, well, seriously, you remember how it started and uh, why the decision was made. After Russia uh, seized uh, some of uh, the properties there and uh, uh, installations and factories there, and then it was a reaction. The answer should probably be in the uh, uh, framework of the UN peacemaking mission. Uh, but it is a long, separate story. Uh, thank you for being provocative. I think we could uh, discuss it uh, later on. And Igor, uh, I mentioned that this year we also have parliamentary elections, and together with having a, a responsible coalition, we'll reach uh, the targets that are outlined in the program. So no need to change the constitution. It's uh, uh, necessary to obey it. Thank you. Thank you. Start with, with Igor, as he is my old friend. Uh, he gave him preferential treatment. So, uh, we are, uh, Timoshenko is the only candidate who basically suggests to move from the current hybrid political system, which is presidential parliamentary, or parliamentary presidential, to parliamentary system. So that's why the, uh, the economic part of the program based on the fulfillment of that. But to reach this, of course, colleagues are right that in six months we will face parliamentary elections, and then depending on the results of the parliamentary elections, uh, 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 the, the coalition or uh, under uh, other circumstances, no coalition will be formed. And then, but what is important now to highlight uh, the priorities, economic priorities. I also agree with Svetlana when she said it is important to aim at the level of economic growth not less than 5% because we will not then catch up, not just with our neighbors, we'll be lagging behind uh, because if you compare economic uh, 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 global trends uh, and the poverty will be the same issue as it is now. So that's the uh, answer on, on uh, uh, your question. And we are preparing to continue uh, engagement with the IMF, uh, other international financial institutions, but we will see it with a, a more emphasis given to the social cohesion, which is not the case now, and we believe we will succeed on that. On uh, um, uh, Sergei's question, uh, the short answer, uh, you have to, we have to fix a uh, question. Why one should fix something which is not broken? So uh, we, the answer is yes and yes, and it's clearly you have the economic course which is stationed there. Someone who co-wrote, uh, was co-author uh, of the letter on the membership action plan uh, back in 2008. So I could uh, uh, say confidently what Timoshenko's uh, uh, intentions are. Uh, however, there is one caveat in your uh, question, and I would like to address this. You said unconditional implementation of the AADCFTA. This is precisely I mentioned why I mentioned Michael Emerson's uh, um, uh, most recent paper, which already considered a need uh, to a new policy that would substitute failed economic neighborhood policy, and then uh, the policy is based on the uh, AA DCFTA. He suggests something that he calls AA plus, 
I would rather call it triple A, uh, uh, which gives a better uh, image. And we, even within the current uh, AA DCFTA, there are clauses, I think 453 article, if I'm not mistaken, that allows the sites, whatever, for whatever reason, to uh, uh, discuss and to negotiate an increase of the quotas or changes. For example, the telecommunication, uh, uh, which is obsolete already in the current version of the DCFTA. We're now talking about digital economy. There's almost nothing about that in the DCFTA. So the logically speaking, I think it would be wrong to insist on uh, to implement something that is already outdated a bit. So we are much more progressive in this way. So that's uh, uh, my answer on your questions. Don't have any doubts of this. And question, uh, Michael's question about uh, Donbass. Uh, it's, it's, it's a larger question. It's not just about uh, blockade. It's about basically uh, uh, two approaches. One, uh, uh, not formally. Sometimes it's even formalized, but it's uh, not public. It's not formal or official policy to cut off Donbass in all senses, not just in terms of the uh, pay in pensions or uh, social benefits or neglecting the IDPs or having horrible situation in the crossing uh, 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 checkpoints where only for two months of this year, 15 people have died already, uh, which is in comparison of last year, it was uh, 15, 1, 5. It was uh, 54 old people, 70, 75, uh, 80 years old. So that's why as a chairman also of the Human Rights Committee, I was always on the record saying that in my opinion, we have formal and informal policy of direct or indirect discrimination of the Ukrainian citizens who are IDPs, and we have more than 1.5 million, and of course it's counterproductive. But in your question, the Donbass uh, is part of the larger uh, confrontation. And we're always talking what should be the incentive for the Kremlin, for Putin, to recalculate, to change his calculation. We believe that incentive to Russia should come not only from what we have sanctions aimed to cause their change of their behavior, but from a larger context of the security order. And the important red line here, that it is important that nothing about Ukraine is decided without Ukraine. That's why when we are the only basically uh, candidate, uh, Timoshenko, who has elaborated, developed in depth, and we're currently engaged in a discussion, a strategy for peace, which is based on Minsk. It is not going to kill Minsk. It would build on Minsk, but it will engage a set of the politically uh, instrumental actors, some of them already within the Normandy, and operationally instrumental actors. Uh, most of them are not, or all of them are not uh, potential instrumental actors, a part of them. One could call it Budapest Plus, one could call P5 Plus, you may call it Normandy uh, Plus, but we do believe that unless Ukraine is taken out of the increasingly smaller box of the bilateral war or at most peripheral conflict, regional conflict in the European periphery and taken in the much larger box where the neuralgic points and the vital national security interest of this uh, big beasts, those who signed Budapest memorandum, as some of them still alive, so are not taken seriously, especially in the background of the collapse of the arms control regime from tactical one, the INF treaty to the strategic one, we uh, unfortunately will not be able to uh, make a breakthrough. Svetlana. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, to Michael about the blockade. Well, I believe that at this point, the main leaders of the race have to answer, have to give a comprehensive an, uh, answer to how they are going to solve uh, the Donbass and Crimea uh, issues. And there are four scenarios. It's war, peace, it's frozen conflict, and to cut the territory. And Mr. Hrutsankor has made it uh, clear that he will look into the peace, peaceful uh, solution, but not at Russian conditions and not with the autonomy in Donbass, which would also further on in the future will stop our potential integration to EU and to NATO. They don't have to have a veto right and they don't have to have uh, pro-Russian uh, local authority on, on Donbass. That's why 
um, this answer have to be a comprehensive answer, of course, and it has to include uh, international peace, peacekeeping mission, uh, transitional justice, humanitarian policy, and so on and so forth. This is the only way to answer at this point uh, to, to the war in the East. Uh, secondly, to Pan Igor Burakovsky about the candidate uh, and uh, his vision of the policies in different areas. Well, I think uh, if the presidential candidate at this point wouldn't have a vision for the country, a vision of the policy, you will be the first one who would expect he him or her to tell it to the society, to the world, who is that, how the, the president is uh, looking uh, in the future. And it's important to say that, of course, uh, the president by the constitution has uh, the um, reserved function, but it also has to be said that every candidate has also the political forces. The political forces will compete for the victories on the parliamentary elections, and it has to be a joint team's uh, effort, of course. Uh, Mr. Hretsenko, by the way, announced that he will introduce uh, five key position in the countries before the elections. I think he was the only one who was brave enough to do that. So we know already the head of the security service, the Mr. Uh, Minister, potential candidate Minister of Defense, National Bank, and General Prosecutor and Minister for Foreign Affairs will come uh, soon. But it seems to me that the real serious presidential candidate has to have the vision uh, for the country. And you also know that it's impossible uh, in our country to do those reforms without agreement, without consensus, without position uh, of the president. And, uh, but when it comes to, for example, independent judicial system, well, the president just have to refuse from the uh, telephone right. That's, that's the way uh, he will reform the judicial system. And the last answer uh, to Serhi. Uh, when it comes to European integration and association agreement, uh, yes, and I started my um, intervention that uh, European integration, Euro-Atlantic integration, is the denominator for the Hretsenko's uh, program. However, I also underlined that it has to be not just on the level of declarations. You probably know that I'm the chair of the subcommittee on European and Euro-Atlantic integration. And I'm also the co-authors of the amendments, for example, to make our defense uh, budget completely transparent. Because, have, however, they haven't been supported by the parliament. They haven't been supported by the biggest parties in the coalition. Because now MPs are voting just seven lines of the defense budget. And this allows uh, them to steal money and this is, by the way, one of the standards of NATO, right? Uh, to have a compatible um, uh, defense transparent uh, budget. In US, they have like 300 pages when they vote on the uh, defense budget. I think this is the real Euro-Atlantic integration, that they have no right and they have no possibility to steal from the soldiers on the East, but they refuse to do so. Also, we have to adopt, for example, oversight over the security services. I also registered this, these amendments. Did Vlog Petra Poroshenko on the Rodney Fern voted for it? No, they didn't support those amendments. These are the core, these are the real Euro-Atlantic integration for the country. Uh, so that's our approach, a, a real reforms that uh, not just declarations, um, uh, not just declarations. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. And with this very specific statement, I would like to acknowledge that the time is over. So it's even more than <laughs> over. Yes, yeah, so, and that is why I have to apologize to those at least six persons who identify their wish to ask. However, there is no such a possibility now. But anyway, you have, the, you have these people here in the room. Uh, they are here and they are available, so you can talk to them. And first, and let me just return the floor to the organizers. Yeah. Ah. Олена, Олена із А я не знаю. Я думаю, що ми залишаємо Dear colleagues, dear colleagues. 
On behalf of the Ukrainian think tank Lezon Office, I'm really thankful for spending this long day with us, for devoting it to Ukraine, and I hope you agree with me that it was worth it, because it really gave an opportunity to see the bigger picture for 2019, challenges, opportunities, how we are facing them, how we exchange the know-how to face these problems. And of course, and of course, especially due to the last panel, it was, I think you could agree with me that it was a good idea to bring the representatives of the main candidates in order to compare, in order to see the possible scenarios for Ukraine. And I think, I think the last panel is uh, really indeed. And again, on behalf of our office, on behalf of our members, in our turn, we hope that we gave you enough food now for thoughts to make your own analysis, to make your own uh, conclusions. And in our, uh, on, in our turn, we will continue our work to bring analysis on Ukraine here in Brussels, in other capitals and international arena to be considered, to be taken into account when it comes on Ukraine's destiny. So see you all at our next events. Thank you very much and till next uh, meetings. Thank you.